Hello. Okay, so let, let me make introductions. So first, uh, welcome everybody to this multinational uh, seminar. We have people at least in Japan, the US, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, I'm not sure where else. Um, so uh, Professor Ju Yantian from the North Carolina State is going to be telling us about heterostructure material, new science enables new properties. Just in the way of introduction, uh, Professor Ju did his PhD in 1994 at University of Texas, Austin. After that, he was a technical staff member for many years in Los Alamos. Um, as a technical staff, as a technical staff member and a team leader, and then he moved to North Carolina State in 2007, where he moved up from associate professor to full professor to distinguished professor, and he's also a professor in the uh, uh, in the mainland's A Thousand Talents program. He's a fellow of the ASM, APS. Uh, AAAS, TMS, MRS has won several awards from several awards from TMS. He's the Institute of Metals Lectures and Rob, Robert Franklin Medal Award winner. He's been a highly cited researcher uh, for several years, founding editor of Materials Research Letters. And I'll also note that he... Um, has 26 patents, over 400 papers, has an H index of over 100. And so as you can see, he's a very distinguished individual. And uh, just for those of us here, I just say we're working very hard to attract him to Hong Kong and the City University. So without uh, wasting any more of your time, I just turned the floor over to Professor Zhu. If anybody has any questions, I think Professor Ju would not mind if you interrupt to ask them. We'll have to speak very loudly since uh, I'm not sure how good the microphones are. So, okay, Yentian, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thanks, Dave, for the introduction. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about heterostructured materials. New science enables new properties. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators. You see, the first one is uh, uh, Professor Xiao Le Wu. His name is louder than others because uh, he did a lot of uh, work in, in this. A uh, lot of work presented here is done by him. Also, Professor Chong Xiao Huang from uh, Sichuan University, Professor Xiao Yi Huang from Chongqing University, Hua Jiangao from Brown, he's in Singapore now. Uh, my students, Xiaolong Ma, Jordan, Xiaotian, and uh, Professor Han from Beijing, uh, from Professor Hao Zhou, uh, Dr. Xiao from Nanjing. For metals and uh, other materials, we always want them to be strong and ductile. Uh, the reason for this is, uh, with this, we can uh, have lighter weight, uh, higher energy efficiency, longer lifetime, higher performance. Uh, these kind of materials are desired for transportation, aerospace, biomedical, and sports. For metals, it's highly for metals. A material is either strong or ductile. You, you can really get both. Uh, this is so-called a banana curve which means, here's an example, uh, for coarse grain materials, you have high ductility, but the strength is very low. Then to increase the strength, we refine the grains to like a nano range. Uh, then strength becomes very high, ductility becomes so low that we do not want to use them. So we really want something like uh, here. We want both high strength and high ductility, but there's, Pretty much your dream, and our textbook tells us no, it's not doable. We know how to make materials strong uh, from our textbook and the literature. We know here are a few strategies. One is the solution hardening, uh, like the jewelry, like a 14K gold that's made of uh, solution hardening. 
Uh, precipitating flooding, like uh, typically aluminum alloys, uh, green refinement, like uh, nanomaterials, uh, cold working, that's actually dislocation hardening. So like a cold root steel, they have a higher strength. However, only having high strength is not good enough. We also need ductility for safety reason before we can use them. These strengthening, strengthening mechanisms, they typically lead to low strength hardening rate, which give us low ductility, which is why we get this banana curve. For example, for nano materials, one example is you can see this under compression, ductility, uh, the strain hardening is almost zero. See, the curve is flat. That's why when we do the tunnel test, it started knocking very quickly. The ductility is very low. And how do we make metal ductile? Basically, there's uh, this hard criteria. There's a D sigma, D epsilon, uh, normalized by flow stress, plus M. M is the strain rate sensitivity which is typically very small room temperature. So we, so we, we approximate that equation to this considering criteria, which means the slope of this curve, stress strain curve, needs to be higher than the flow stress. From here, you can see that for stronger material, we have higher flow stress. We need even much higher uh, strain hardening to get to maintain the same ductility. However, unfortunately, like in this nano example, the strength is high, but the strength hardening goes to zero. That's why we have low ductility. Now we know the reason. Okay, my computer is heating up. Okay. Now we know the reason for low ductility. This is why for nano metals, we all have a very high strength. Here, here it shows many times higher than conventional cross grain metals, but the ductility is so low, we cannot use it. Even some of these data, the, the data points, uh, they use the elongation to failure because they use a very small sample. This is like over exaggerated. Um, uh, the real ductility even lower margin than this. So the real issue is how do we improve ductility, otherwise we cannot use it no longer, uh, no matter how strong they are. Okay, here are a few strategies for improving ductility of nanometers. The first is pre-existing pre twins. This is done by Professor Kilo. And uh, this is another one, the formation twins. During the tensile test, we activated twins. This is my own work. Other one is uh, uh, nano precipitation in the nano grains. So that forces this location to accumulate to give us higher strain hardening to improve ductility and also high angle grain boundaries. However, you notice that the improvement in ductility are very limited. It's not much, although we have some ways to do it. And also each of these strategy can be applied to a certain kind of alloys. It's not universal. Another question is, as we are working on the metals in the alloys, sometimes we meet colleagues from other fields that say, well, uh, metals and alloys have been studied for over a century. What new do you have uh, to study? And uh, why are you guys still doing that? So most of us, uh, we also think we know everything almost about metals. Now, the question is, do we have new uh, explored mechanisms to improve strength and ductility? Is it possible to have any new breakthroughs in metals? Because this is, is such an old area, such an old discipline. Here's one hint. Uh, this, this example is, uh, uh, I have steel. I have steel is uh, basically is ferrite steel developed develop for the auto industry. And you know, for uh, energy efficient cars like uh, electrical cars, you want lighter weight. 
So to get a higher strength, people typically, uh, for the, from these references, they try to reduce the grain size. However, when the strength increases to a certain point, the ductility is so low, you cannot use them anymore. However, when you get this into gradient structure, see on the surface, you get a nano structure, uh, nano grains, in the center you get coarse grains, then we got this kind of data points. You see, this uh, gradient structure gives us the strength and ductility combination that's not accessible to homogeneous materials. This gives us some hope. This is our paper published in PNAS in 2014. And so from here, we thought about a new materials and then after uh, last couple of years, couple of years of research, we also find its theoretical basis. Basis. What is the heter heterostructure of materials? Basically, it's a non-uniform uh, material, uh, but it's not just uh, any non-uniform. It has to be on a certain structural scale to be effective. Uh, why is it good? It can simultaneously increase the yield strength, and at the same time, improve work hardening rate by so-called hydro-deformation induced hardening. This is a deformation given by me. It used to be called the Baxter's hardening, which I found later that it was not accurate. So I'll show you later what is uh, this IGDI hardening. So what kind of a material can be called Heterostructural materials was the definition. If a material has a large strength difference among different domains, which, which I mean from one domain area to another domain area, or one domain volume to another domain, another domain volume, then that's called heterostructural material. Using that definition, we can see gradient structure. That's called, that should be one type of hydrostructure. That's the earlier example. Laminate structure, people have been studying this for a few decades. It has, they have a better property, but nobody knows why. Now we know. Uh, so the one harmonic structure, it actually it's a core shell structure. Harmonic is defined by a Japanese professor. Uh, or bimodal or multimodal structure, a dual phase or multi phase structure. This has been there for like two decades also. And, but they don't know what's the principle, why they got a good property earlier. And the last one, the heterogeneous lamella structure. I'm going to stress this one because this gave us the best property. Basically, the fundamental basis of these materials are the IGDR hardening to increase the yield strength, okay? Then we'll have AGDR hardening after yielding to increase work hardening so that we also get high ductility. Remember, in conventional materials, it can get only one of these, but now we get both. So what, what is AGDR strengthening? Uh, what's the physical origin? Here I'm using two cartoons here. And the first cartoon uh, is this one. See, so this is cross grained domain, that's a uh, nano domain, for example. In the cross grained domain, in this grain, you have, say, say a frank read, frank read dislocation source. They emit all these locations, they got all piled up in front of the domain boundary, uh, as shown here. These dislocations, they all have the same Brooks vector. That's why they, they are called the geometrically necessary dislocations, or GNPs, because they do cause lattice location. Okay? If you have, if you see this, if you see the, if you see the dislocation distribution, you can see there's a dislocation, there's a GNP radian here, distribution. Since the plastic strain is caused by the slip of dislocations, and we know that 
At the boundary, so since no dislocation has reached there, and the strain is zero, near the dislocation source, you have a higher strain, which means if you smooth them, you have a strain profile like this, near the boundary. So you, if you derive this, uh, the derive, derivative of this is the strain gradient, which means you have TNDs piling up, then you will have strain gradient, and from there, uh, you will have long range back stress because all the dislocations, they form long range back stress to prevent any more dislocation to slip forward, to repair more dislocations. This long range stress is called back stress, as has been defined in the literature. On the other hand, this cartoon. If we have this location, at the tip of this piling up, you see a stress concentration. This stress concentration is either applied to the hard domain, and this is called forward stress because it, it promotes deformation in the hard domain. It's not like a, uh, it, it's going opposite way. It's directing the opposite to the back stress. So this is a forward stress. And the together, collectively, they produce IGDS stress. So this is the definition of IGDS stress. When we do the measurement, we measure this IGDS stress because this is the couple at the boundary, the forward stress equal the back stress, at, but they have opposite direction at the boundary. But away from the boundary, they are different. Okay. Uh, let me go to the next one. So there are several uh, different kind of GNDs, uh, depending on how they are uh, aligned up. If they are aligned like this, the piling up, this gives us the strongest uh, IGDR hardening. However, if they pile up like this, stacking up like this, this is the typical small angle tilt boundary. It does not produce any IGDR hardening. Uh, it's on short range stress. However, it may have a mixed type like this, it's like an intermediate. Another type of dislocation distribution like this is totally random. They, we call this as statistical, statistically stored dislocation. They pro, do not produce uh, back stress, but they produce dislocation hardening because when other dislocation comes, they have to cut through this dislocation forest that causes dislocation hardening. So conventional wisdom about this uh, strengthening uh, or hardening is this. The dislocation is from, t is, it is called a dislocation hardening. This is by Ashby in 1970. So the, this, the flow stress uh, of a sample uh, equal to, see this is, Density of statistical dislocation, the density of TNDs. Basically, the square root of total dislocation density uh, is proportional to the flow stress, which means that's why we are saying that if you want to increase the strain hardening, you have to increase dislocation accumulation. That's our conventional wisdom. It totally ignored the GNDs. The GND, in addition to provide dislocation hardening, it also produce HDS hardening. But for conventional metal, we have totally ignored them because without them, we can also explain the property very well because the HDS hardening in conventional metal is very small. Okay. Here's another way, a cartoon, to show a new scientific principle in hydrostructural materials. For hydrostructural materials, if we see this in this cartoon, this rock above water, we see that is conventional dislocation strengthening or dislocation hardening, the idea hardening is totally add onto that. It's like this tower uh, above that. So we have additional mechanism in addition to that. That's what gives us better property. For conventional digital hardening, is a trade-off. You can only have one 
not at all. You can have higher strings, uh, higher yield strings for high dissipation density, but if you have that, the dissipation accumulation will be limited. So you can only have a both, there's a trade off. But the difference is for IDDR hardening, the advantage is as it's not a trade off, you can have a both. That's why this heterostructured material has an advantage. Okay, earlier I showed this banana curve. This once at a, at a MSD meeting, I said, everybody knows this is banana curve. I want, you can have high strength or high ductility, you can have both. I said, I want both like this. When I did this, the whole uh, the certain room started laughing. I said, you laugh because you think that's ridiculous. I said, don't laugh, that's true about them. One example. This is a federal genius lamana titanium. So this is coarse green titanium with green size about 44 micrometers. Then after uh, cryo ruling, we get to ultra fine greens. After that, we did a partial recrystallization annealing. So they produce some recrystallized greens, like here. You have larger green. Yes, unrepresented grains, they still, uh, still uh, ultra fine grain. They have very high strength. They the softer domain, harder domain. We have this kind of a structure. Look at this property. So, cold grain titanium is has low strength, higher ductility. Not a surprising. When we get ultra fine grain, grains are very small. Then we have high strength, very low ductility which make it unusable. It's also not a surprising. However, when we get this new structure, you see here, the strength is close to UFG uh, uh, The ductility is even higher than cosgrain ones. So this really validates what we have learned from a textbook. First, in this, in this structure, in this structure, this cosgrains we have like a, by volume, we have 25% of the cause grains. If you have these large grains, according to power project relationship, the strength should come down, but it does not come down. Even for those non recrystallized area, there must be dislocation recovery, which means lower dislocation density. So according to Ashley's equation, the strength should also come down, but the strength does not come down. So this is valid everything we know from the textbook. So when I showed this to Professor Bill Nix, he said this does not make sense. Something must be wrong. So it took us a few months to figure out this is really at that point our understanding is the back stress. So we used that, he he was persuaded and we published it in PNAS. This is the paper we studied this new field. In published in PNAS, now is cited for almost 300 times already in, in a little bit over two years. So this is why we have this high strength, high yield strength. If you look at this grain, this larger grain, recrystallized, it's totally surrounded by other fine grain matrix. And you have this dislocation piling up, you can see many of them. All these green lines, they are dislocating piling ups. The dislocate, so before, before yielding, this dislocating piling up, the, uh, the front resource gets started, they start to pile up against the boundary, but the matrix is still elastic, so the dislocating cannot transmit the plastic strain across the boundary, which means this is bag stress continue to build up inside of this and until the matrix started plastic deformation, which makes this lighter grain almost as strong as the matrix, which is why you get a very high strength. So this is the explanation. Well, how about the high strength hardening? We can, in the early, this one, we can see this strength hardening, strength hardening rate, uh, for out of UFG, it's a little black line, it's like this. For, you have, for UFG, the green line is lower, not a surprising because it has a smaller green size. 
But for these hydrostructural ones, the string hardly really give a higher than cosmic ones, which is, which cannot be explained using our previous knowledge. Here we know why, because in addition to this locating density increase, we have additional IGDI or hardening uh, added onto that. How do you know that? Here we know this sample, uh, we had a total elongation of 94%. But if we see this, this recrucified grains before sample test, they are equalized. Afterward, they become elongated. From this ratio of elongation, we calculate their, their plastic strain is about 45%. Which means the money we which also means the hard domain we have a strain much less than nine point four percent. But as the boundary, the strain got to be the same because otherwise the boundary will fail. So which means there got to be string gradient near the boundary. If they have that, they got to have G and this, they will produce IVDI stress. That's from the peak from this. And structure, that's our hypothesis. Then we did a measurement. Indeed, here is the strengthening due to uh, dislocating density accumulation. Due, due, due to dislocating accumulation. Here is the strengthening due to back stress. You can see it's a much higher than dislocating strengthening. So in conventional metal, this green line should be much lower than that red line. But for this hydrostructural material, if you design it well, this IDDS stress can be much higher than this location line, which, which, which is why we got such a good property. We cannot be explained by textbook. We, we also developed the equation on how to calculate the IDDS stress. And uh, I'm not going to go to detail here because that's boring. But here I want to compare the dislocating hardening, uh, how that compare that with the IEDR hardening. For dislocating hardening, this well known in our textbook, the isotropic is a shorter range dislocating interaction is related to total dislocating density. For IEDR hardening, we still do, do not know very well. It's a long range stress, is a kinematic, is a directional, is always opposing to the applied stress. Is it related to piling up of GNDs? Is it correlated with the Bosinger effect? Many people know the Bosinger effect, but that's just used as a scientific curiosity. Nobody has used that as a to design material. After knowing all this, we know what kind of structure gave us the better property, which means higher IGDI hardening. First, we need a high density of interfaces because these locations are piling up against those interfaces. We also need appropriate, appropriate interface spacing because the piling up cannot last uh, very long. Uh, our current experience is, is less than 10 micrometer. Also, the soft domain is totally embedded in hard domain. So this is a totally different from our conventional material, material design concept. In conventional material design, we say, okay, this metal is too soft. You want to make it stronger, what do you do? You add uh, stronger second phases or fibers. So the strength, stronger phase is always a minority. Here the concept is, this material is very strong. It's not ductile enough. How to improve ductility? We add softer domain as a minority to the hard matrix. It's opposite to our conventional approach. So in the beginning, uh, earlier when I defined the IGDI stress, we, we, I used this cartoon to say, OK, here's a string gradient, here's a dislocated piling up. From here, we say there, I said there is, is a GND gradient, uh, GND density gradient. So we don't know if that's real or not, which is just my assumption. So to test that idea, we use this kind of copper bronze laminated sample 
to do test testing uh, this way in a horizontal way. And as the interface spacing decreases, we can see strength increased, ductility also increased. It really gives us a better property. And, but we want to see if we really have the, this GND density gradient uh, to, to verify that hypothesis. So we tried that. We basically we use the EBSD to measure GND density near the interface. What we find is, see here, indeed, there is a GND density gradient here. So that means, yeah, our hypothesis for GND density gradient is correct. That made us very happy, but we continue to uh, which is the show that see here this, this uh, another summary is there is a string gradient for this string gradient because you see the string distribution is at the interface the string is very small is almost zero away from the string away from the interface the string is higher so you so this slope is positive which you are call this positive string gradient. So we want to measure the string gradient near the interface. So we use the same sample and the same kind of tensor testing. We, we use the, we develop an in-situ high resolution digital image correlation technique to measure the string near the interface. Here's what we found. And it's not a very uniform, but we integrated them together here are the curves here. See, what we find is, here's the where interface is. Near the interface, the string is the highest instead of lowest. And which means, instead of having this positive string gradient as showing here in a hypothesis, we have a negative string gradient is the opposite. So we know that the Plastic strain is the highest near the dislocation source. From here, we came to a conclusion, which, which was all the dislocations were emitted, emitted from the uh, domain boundary, which means the dislocation source are at the green boundary. It's not a friendly source. We were uh, quite confident at that moment when we published this paper in Materials material Today, because there is a minority opinion by a few professors showing, saying that these locations resources are the going boundary, not the primary resource. So we came to the same conclusion, we said, well, maybe they are right, although they, although they are minority. Okay. This seems like we solved the problem. However, we, we thought about, is this correct? We have not really seen where are the dislocating from. So we really want to see them. And seeing is believing we do not want to go uh, use the secondary evidence. So to see really where the dislocation are from, we did the in situ TEM. Here's a T in situ TEM. We use the same kind of sample in the tunnel test under TEM. This took um, a post of two years to get this few minutes. Mm -hmm. Less than one minute of video, we solve the problem. Okay, here you see, here's the boundary, here's a cosmic the copper, that's the bronze, this is the boundary. You see, what's this? This is a typical frankly source. And we saw a lot of frankly sources inside grains, which means the frankly sources are still playing the dominant role here. So that material today conclusion we came to was wrong. So what we found was um, is, if, instead of a dislocation from the source in our, in our textbook, we, we thought the dislocation source will continue immediate dislocation, we will get a piled up at the boundary. That's not the case, what we observed observe here. We found the dislocation are very dynamic. 
they just form constantly inside the copper grain. Once they form, they will emit a few dislocations and then get destroyed or disappear. And which, which means it's a dynamic nature. So this, this is what people do not know before. It's, uh, we have never learned this uh, before. So this is a new discovery. Secondly, we also find that the closer it is to the interface, the easier it is to activate a front reader source. In other words, the front reader source, there's a density distribution for front reader source. It's a density of front reader source gradient. That's what gave us negative string gradient. The third, another discovery is those dislocations emitted from front reader sources, most of them disappeared at the boundary, which means they do not stay there for us to, to see afterward. Which also means the string gradient we observed and the GND density gradient we observed, they have no quantitative relationship because a lot of genes already disappeared. Before this, we always think they are quantitatively related. This is in a paper by Professor Hua Gao and Bill Nix in a 1999 paper, which has been cited maybe 5,000 times or so. So, so what do you mean they have like a plastic uh, 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 gradient plastic theory? And with this discovery, they have to really revise their theory. Part of with Huayan, as the years they have to revise their theory because the, there something was wrong. So, so this discovery is very important because it really tells us many things we believe the correct before actually are wrong. We need to uh, change our theory, change our concept. More recently, um, we also found that see, in the early time, we always assume that this location uh, is, uh, def the deformation is uniform. However, here we found, that, see here, this is a laminated structure, this is copper, bronze copper. If you look at the deformation, you have a lot of string bands. They are not a uniform deformation. So these are all string bands across the domain boundary. And this is the one example. And we'll find this, those bands, uh, uh, they give you this, uh, this negative string gradient, uh, this uh, peak of width is kind of relatively constant with the applied string, but the height, the intensity increases with the applied string. Later, we also found this in other type of hydrostructures. So this one, this one, this one is a gradient nickel. So it's also, you see, gradient nickel on the surface. We also have, we also see these bonds. By the way, when we try to do the same thing on cause gradient nickel, this does not appear. So it does not have any impure cause gradient nickel. It does not occur in nanostructures. It's a nickel easier because in nanostrike nickel, once you find the forms, it fails quickly. So this only happens in hydrostructure ones. And later, we also tried a bimodal uh, nickel. Uh, bimodal nickel means we have, for this example, we have 30% 30, 30 cross grain nickel uh, in a matrix of ultra fine grain nickel. See, they also appear in a similar way, in a similar way, which means the stream binding is really a deformation mechanism or phenomena related to heterostructure. Um, to reform, rephrase it, heterostructure promote shear band, uh, stream band formation. But now we have other questions from here. We don't know what's happening inside this 
string bands. What's this location doing? We do not know. So this is our future study here. Only after that, we can understand what's going on there so that we can design materials, uh, hydrostatic materials better. Um, in the end, I hope we can have a mathematical equation or the best will be analytical equation to tell us what kind of hydrostructure gave us the best property. That will be my next goal, but that's not easy. Uh, I'm trying to derive this equation from dislocating theory, but I need to understand what's going on in the physics first so that I can have a better assumption. So I will show you what's the science of hydrostructure materials, why they, and I also showed their greater properties. But the basic part of hydrostructure materials is this. They can be processed with the current industrial facility, which means they're easy to scale up. It has a low cost. This is a big advantage. Now think about uh, earlier, there are other uh, advanced materials like uh, nanostructural metals and or metallic glass. The, the commercialization has been very, uh, there's no large scale application. The reason for, for that is caused by the scaling up issue and the cost issue. So this has no such issue. Uh, we, we use some of the concepts to work on steel um, then right now there are steel steel mills they already show the interest. They said that's great, and they can develop new steels with this concept. So they want to fund us. And another good thing is for our researchers, this is in such an early stage. There are so many things we do not understand. We continually get surprised by what we see, which means it justify our research for many years to come. So this is, has new science, new property, and a good application. That's why this material is so interesting. So I've been trying to sell this concept to everyone I, meet, uh, I see, I meet. So last year, in 2019, I'm seeing last year, this area has really started to take off. Before that, I was thinking, I was seeing it's like an airplane is taxiing on the runway, uh, but last year is, it, it took off. Uh, one example is, one evidence is this. See how many future conference, conferences we have. Uh, we have a biannual uh, symposia uh, TMS on, uh, on hydrostructural materials, and we also have a biannual TMS meeting on UFG, hydrofine green, and hydrostructural materials. Basically, we have one every year, TMS meeting. Look at the TMS website. They added nanostructures and hydrostructures and materials as a new category of these meetings, new category of materials. So this is already registered there. And we, we also have initiated a biannual recording conference on this. Our first recording conference was last year in June in Hong Kong. So next year will be, the next one will be next year, still in Hong Kong. And in China, we have a Chinese materials conference. See, uh, last year we had our first uh, symposium here on this. So we will have one symposium every year here. And, and also there's a Chinese NSF workshop on this topic. This is also biannual every other year. So, uh, other small ones, including a uh, professor in Japan organizing this every year in his, in his university. So, so this is really taking off. Right now, I, I estimate there are over 100 groups working on this. Another sign of taking off is looking at my own citation last year. You see, this is in 2019. You see a, a sudden increase. That is because I checked my uh, papers on hydrostructural materials, they get high citations now. And this is for Google, from Google. This is, you see, another big jump also uh, uh, for uh, residual ID. It's all due to the hydrostructural materials. 
I, I expect this increase will be exponential in the next few years. And I think CPU has a unique advantage to become the leader in this emerging field because we have so many top caliber uh, faculty members in our materials department. And uh, I've talked to many of them and they showed the interest in this. I look forward to collaborating with them. So, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll end here. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Okay, uh, so we can take questions from the people here, and then we'll see if there's questions from people who, on Skype. Okay, so anybody want to ask a question first? Uh, okay, let me start with a, with a very simple question. Okay, go ahead, Tanya. Um, so, Professor, you talk about the, the best strengths and ductility. So, um, I, I, um, I'm wondering about the fracture toughness of this. We do not know fracture toughness yet, since this is a new area. There are so many properties we do not know yet. However, we are collaborating with Professor Rob Ritchie. We gave him some sample. He's doing this kind of study now. I'm waiting to see his result. And he and another group published a paper on gradient. Uh, uh, one type of heterostructure, which is the gradient, they find a better fracture toughness there. Okay. You take? Yeah. Yes. Uh, see, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I agree with you. There are other mechanisms to give you work hardening to get higher ductility. What I'm seeing is, for example, for high entropy alloys, and if you design a heterostructured high entropy alloy, you already have high ductility, but if you make them heterostructured, it even it give you additional uh, ductility and strength, even better than what you already got. You add on to that to get an even better property. That's why we should get it with the hydrogen base, right? We put that right. second base part of it. We like right. We have high yield first, high work hardening rate. That's the best yes. place, right? Yes. 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 I noticed that there are recently there are several papers on heterostructured high entropy alloys. They have excellent properties. Uh, let, let me follow up on that question. So, it, um, 
if you if you look at the materials that you talked about, the heterostructural materials, those materials seem to be, um, I guess I would say, polarized in the sense that if you strain it in one direction, you build up the long range stress in one particular direction. But if you take that material now and load it in a different direction, then that long range stress that you built up from the heterogeneity um, will not help you. It'll actually hurt you. And, you know, if you compare that to the materials that CT was talking about, which are more homogeneous, that is, they're not polarized, they're the same in all directions. You know, what do you, what do you see the kinds of applications are going to be limited by the fact that this only works when you continue to load in one direction? So, for example, if you load in one direction and then you switch it or you uh, go, like, for example, in a fatigue scenario or something where you uh, polarize it and, and then load it in a different direction, what do you see the limitations that arise from the fact that this is a polarized structure instead of a homogeneous structure? Uh, well, really, uh, let, me put it, let me put it this way. There are different kind of heterostructures. Depending on your real application, you can design different hydrostructure for that purpose. For example, as you said, uh, uh, the fatigue. In this scenario, you can actually, uh, in the surface, you design a gradient structure, which gives you better fatigue property. I'm not saying hydrostructure material will solve all the problems. So it's coming out applicable to certain scenarios. But there are so many different hydrostructures, you, you have to choose the right one for that particular application. Okay, that's fair. Uh, Furang? Can I ask a question? Uh, in Chen, this is uh, Furang. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, Furang, I can hear you. Yeah, um, see, I'm not in the field here, so uh, whether. Uh, let me ask you, uh, can you give me the example of the possible application of your heterostructure material that is much superior than the present uh, material that can be applied? Uh, say, did you know any application cases that uh, uh, heterostructure material can do better than the present uh, metals, you know, the present materials? Uh, yes, I have, I have one example. Uh, remember uh, earlier I have that titanium one? That titanium, uh, this one is actually uh, sample is in a foil shape. Later, one of my collaborator, uh, uh, Professor uh, Chong Xian Huang in Sichuan University, he processed similar structure, but uh, the sample is the inner form of a rod, titanium rod, like uh, with a diameter, like a uh, five millimeter to 10 millimeters, and, uh, with a high strength and high ductility. They are actually trying to use this to make dental implants. They are at a stage that the the Chinese government, they have, they already had some meeting. They have passed several hurdles. They are making standards for this, and that may come to the market very soon. So they are really excited about this. Before this, we also tried nanostructured titanium, but the ductility is much lower. And uh, this hydrostructured materials, uh, it had high pro very high. Activity, but the processing cost is also very low. So, yeah, so that sure. new I'm product sure. will come to market very soon. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure whether the, for the uh, dental application, we really need care about optimize the ductility or strength. Uh, you know, uh, I, I yes. That, you know. yes, yes, you need because if you look at what they are using for medical implants, the majority of the uh, material they are using is the Thai 6 4, 6 uh, aluminum for vanadium. For Thai 6 4, uh, aluminum and vanadium are bad to your body. 
So it do not last that long. The, the idea we will use pure titanium, but to have titanium is not strong enough. So there is actually demand in the in the dental industry. I mean, they for to use uh, pure titanium to make the dental implants. This make this makes it possible. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I can I ask one more question? Uh, yeah, sure. You, in in a, in a conclusion, you uh, you say that uh, it is easy to be scale up. Uh, for yes. you know, I, I'm thinking about the engineering application. Usually, we need very big mass piece of the materials. Uh, my question is: Is the mechanism we investigate in with a small piece of material? Is it equally applicable to uh, the big piece of uh, materials? I'm losing you uh, by the connection. <laughs> yeah, because you may... Can you, can you repeat? Uh, I think I lost the connection. Uh, well, let, 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 me, let me just repeat the question. So the question is, Hello? you can, you know, you, you study these in relatively small scale samples, but a lot of industrial applications require very large scale applications, very large scale yeah. materials. So the question was, is you know, if you try to scale this up, how easy is it to scale up? And that, that's a good question. Uh, so we had a meeting with uh, uh, with uh, 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 with this uh, director of the Paul Steel uh, of the have research institute on steels, and we use the real steel, uh, and then. We made them into hydrostructure. We showed them a property, and they said that's a, that's a real, real steel. We, we just use the ruling mill. The ruling mill is an industrial process, and they said that's great. Uh, our uh, processing parameters will cost less than your, even their current processing. So they got really excited about this. Uh, we they are giving us a project. To, to check this out. They say that we will, in our laboratory, we'll make small samples. They, in their lab, they will make like a, uh, uh, like a real production to see how, how that works. If it works, they will go to their real production. So it doesn't need to go through that stage. However, with their current ruling mill, we can produce this structure without any new investment in their facility. We just change their processing parameters, which can give this give this kind of structure. I mean, theoretically. Okay, can I ask a question another way? If we have a big piece of material, then you do testing, all right? Uh, yeah. Strength, you know, uh, strength curve testing. And then you cut out yep. a small pieces of material, you put into TM yep. from the yep. surface, Toward the uh, interior material, did you expect we see all the same things? Do you understand? My oh, you see the same process effect. Because and I have studied that. There is a long a time. Gradient, uh, the thickness right. right, right, right. So. Uh, let me give you one example. So this, uh, this titanium showing on the screen. This is a very small sample. It's a foil. Uh, it's like a few hundred micrometers thick. We got that mechanical property, like this one, this mechanical property. We, we got the same question from Professor uh, Chu Xian Huang. He said, why do you got this good property? Because your sample is too small. And we do not have enough, we do not have enough sample to make a lot of samples. But later, he made this rod sample with diameter like five millimeter to 10 millimeter. I did a testing, they got a similar property. So what it means when you make a smaller sample, you have to make sure your gauge length to the cross-section area is larger than your certain ratio to, so that the curve will be similar. If you get the wrong sample, you get a gauge length too small, you have a problem. I guess if, if you're in a situation where the uh, scale of the sample is still large compared to the scale of the heterogeneity, 
then I would imagine that everything would be okay. But once you start making the sample smaller than the scale of this heterogeneous structure, then you lose everything. Right, you can make too small, this is a problem. Uh, uh, that's, what, that's, that's what we have seen. So when we make a sample, we think, we think the smallest you have to have like a data length above 10 millimeter. Uh, that's the smallest. If we below that, we don't trust the curve. And uh, you know, another thing is when we see ductility, we use the uniform elongation. The uniform elongation is less affected by the sample size. So not use the total elongation. The total elongation is not good for small sample. Um, and, and also, here the comparison, for all the comparison, like the cause green ones, heterostrogen ones, they are compared on the same, same with the same sample size. So they are relative. A lot of samples, the property may be different, but they should be improved also if you use the same sample. Okay, that needs to be verified. Okay, I have a question that came in online on a streaming chat. Uh, Professor, yeah. Professor uh, Wang Feng, he says, is the, okay. is the composition more important or the strain more important for the mechanical property of the heterostructured materials? It's the, it's the, it's the both, actually. Well, the structure is more important, but the composition can help with modifying the IGDI strength. For example, if you have a material with a lower stacking for the energy, it's easier for the GNDs to pile up. You will have a stronger IGDI stress effect. If it has a very high stacking for the energy, uh, they will got to, uh, go cross sleeping, they will not pile up. Uh, uh, for very long, so you have a weaker IGDI effect, which means, I mean, you can change the you can change the uh, stacking for energy by uh, alloy, which means the composition design is also important. But I did not discuss that part in this talk, but it's there. We are working on that. So the composition affects the strain, so you can't separate the two. That's your conclusion. Uh, right, right. Composition will you affect how the gene is pile up or how easy they are to pile up. Right. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should probably end this. I think if there are any more questions that we get, uh, we can send them to you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, uh, we're, you're, we recorded the talk and we'll make it available also to faculty who missed the presentation. But I think you have quite uh -huh. a few faculty watching uh, uh, watching this online, and uh, you know I think there were what like uh, six or seven of us in the room uh, watching. Well, more than that. Uh, so let me thank you again, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. So thank, thank you. you for your talk. Thank you. Thanks.